Okay, the next talk is given by Sal Jalouz on describing clinical intersections in the NISC era for photochemistry applications. This is a pre-recorded talk, so there'll be no live Q&A at the end. However, the speaker will be on hand to answer your questions in the appropriate Slack channel. So, over to you, Sal. Hi, everybody. My name is Sal Jalouz. I'm a postdoc researcher working in Amsterdam in the Boyer University in a group of uh, Luke Vich, a group of quantum chemistry. Uh, however, I'm still a theoretical physicist, so I'm working in between quantum chemistry and quantum computing in collaboration with the University of Leiden, also in, uh, in the Netherlands. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity today to speak about a recent work that I've developed um, that is actually about uh, a NISC friendly method called the state average orbital optimized VQE approach. Um, a NISC friendly approach is specifically dedicated to the description of conical intersection on near term quantum devices. So, in this talk, in the first part, uh, I will take time to motivate why conical intersection are so important in quantum chemistry and in nature, speaking about two different phenomena, uh, phenomena in which uh, conical intersections uh, are known to shine a lot. Uh, in the second part, I will talk about classical methods that could be used in order to describe conical intersection, but I will try to show the limitation of this method. And um, based on the knowledge we can have on this, uh, from this method, I will then speak about uh, the approach we developed, the SAO VQE uh, method, and I will then give an application of uh, this uh, approach uh, looking for the conical intersection of uh, the formaldehyde molecule. So let's go. So the, the first question you may ask yourself is what is a conical intersection? So a conical intersection is a single point of degeneracy that arises when, uh, for example, two uh, potential energy surfaces get connected together. For example, here we have a ground set for molecules in its first excited state. And this is a conical intersection. So this very strange spectral beast uh, is actually present in a lot of system. And you may ask yourself, why is it so important to focus on this? Because conical intersections are known to mediate many photo-induced processes. And I will give here a first example of this with the concept of photo dissociation. So let's suppose we have uh, that kind of system composed of two bounded fragments, and this uh, system exhibits that kind of pest with a conical intersection. Initially, we suppose that the system is uh, a local minimum. And when a photon um, is incoming, the ladder is able to absorb the photon and gets promoted to, to its first electronic excited state because locally it's not uh, a minimum. Uh, nuclear forces will push the system to evolve on this space and the ladder will fall inside the conical intersection thanks to what is called non-radiative relaxation. At this moment, two different uh, situations can arise. Either the system uh, goes back to its original um, situation, nothing new, or the ladder can also uh, go on the right and end up photo dissociated. So as you can see here, the presence of a conical intersection can lead to very different, um, very different configuration for the system. And this is something that is well known in quantum chemistry, very, very uh, interesting feature that has been uh, studied, for example, in many molecules. For example, in these two molecules, ammonia and O and H, uh, many studies are focused on the dissociation of one hydrogen atom based on this uh, kind of pest and on the presence of a conical intersection. But you have also to know that uh, conical intersections are not only present in photo dissociations, they also play a key role in what is called the photo isomerization. So to illustrate this, let's suppose we have that kind of system and we have a pest that is actually representing the rotation of the head of the molecule in pink here around this axis. Initially, we suppose that the system is in this state. So as before, a photon uh, is incoming, absorbed by the system, the ladder is excited, can relax, the system can go back to its original situation, nothing new, but the system can also go to the second pocket and end up with 
a rotation of the head. This is what is called the photoisomerization from the cis conformation to a trans conform conformation of the molecule. So the rotation. And you have to know that this is uh, very, very fundamental because it's at the origin of a process that is fundamental for us for every day in our everyday life that is the vision process. So this is all of us. We have a brain, we have an eye, and this is what is occurring when we look at the bulb. The ladder emits a photon, our eye absorbs the photon, and inside the eye, we have the retinal molecule with a very complex shape like this. And this molecule is known to undergo a photoisomerization as what I explained before here. When the photon is incoming on this, the ladder uh, is able to absorb, the photon, there is this original photoisomerization that is occurring by a rotation over around the CC bond. And this photoisomerization is known to be at the origin of the generation of nerve Im impulse to the brain. In other way, when your eye absorbs the photon, all of this process, thanks to the presence of conical section, allows your brain to interpret what you're looking at right now. So I hope that thanks to these two, uh, to these two uh, examples, photoisomerization and photodissociation, you are now more convinced about the importance of conical intersection in nature. Now let's uh, switch to how we could try to describe conical intersection with classical uh, simulation. So our goal is here to accurately describe the conical intersection in the past. But you have to know that most of the time, if you are dealing with complex system, if you use small active spaces, such as what we usually do in quantum computing with Newton device, actually conical intersection can be very hard to reproduce. For complex system, I mean. To demonstrate this, I'm going to consider for the rest of this work, the formaldehyde molecule that is actually a very well-known toy model in quantum chemistry for the retinal, more complex retinal molecule I introduced uh, previously. And uh, this molecule is known also to contain a conical intersection in its uh, electronic spectrum. So <clears throat> I'm going to focus on the bending angle precisely here. And uh, this is what I obtain if I do a complete active space calculation with a large active space and with a small active space. So typically this is reachable by only classical device. And this is uh, the limit typically of what uh, should be reachable for uh, current uh, NISC device. So here we clearly see that if we want to do simulation on a quantum computer with a small active space, we totally miss the point here. We are not able to represent the conical intersection that we can only get access to with very large active space calculation. So KCI, 16 electrons and 16 orbitals, we get access to the conical intersection. We, when we diminish the active space, we lose this feature. What can we do? So is there any other uh, classical algorithm? Of course, there is another one that is called this, the KCCF method. And that is known to include what is called the orbital optimization approach. So it's an augmented version of KCI, which actually try to optimize the molecular orbitals to optimize the result with respect to a specific uh, state. For example, here I do this calculation to, to optimize for this active space, the grand state. And this is what I obtain in black here. This is the ground state, slightly lower than what we obtained before with KCI, but it comes at the cost that you deliberately uh, deteriorate the, the shape of the excited states. So it, this, this result shows that using uh, uh, an approach like KCCF, which implements orbital optimization only with respect to one state is not the way to go if you want to accurately represent uh, uh, a, a complex features such as conical intersection, which is actually a degeneracy. So what can we do here if we have to stick to a small active space? 
There is another approach that is called the state average KCCF. And this approach is actually a more complex one, a little bit more, I would say. But if I use this approach, in the end, and I compute the 2D pass of the molecule, I end up with the good result. We have a conical intersection. So what is new here? What is the difference compared to um, state average KCCF? Uh, sorry, to um, state specific KCCF, as I discussed before. Here, state average KCCF is known to have the strength that it treats um, an ensemble of potentially degenerate states on an equal footing. And this is precisely what we have to do if we want to accurately represent degeneracy, degenerate state. And to do so, what is done in state average KCCF is a state average orbital optimization. So this seems to be the key, what we have to use if we want to um, describe that kind of conical intersection, that kind of complex feature on a quantum device restricted to a small size active space. So this is exactly what motivated the, um, the approach uh, that is called the state average orbital optimized VQE method. But it, it goes a little bit beyond simply doing a state average orbital optimization. Let me explain it. So I will reuse this example as the test bed for us, and we are still looking for the conical intersection of the formaldehyde molecule. The idea of our method is the following. We have to build a method that is able to capture conical intersection on a NISC device. And to do so, this method has to always treat the ensemble of states in a democratic way. Okay. But it goes beyond orbital optimization. It also uh, implies that you have to build up a configuration interaction solver that is also respecting this fundamental ID. And by this, I mean, I don't want here to build a very good description of a ground state and, and then build a, a, a lower version this description of uh, the first excited state. No, because both of them are at some point degenerate. They, are, they have always to be treated in the same manner. So in the approach, the SAOOVQ approach, to respect this, uh, this ID, we actually use two um, interdependent sub-algorithm working actually in a state average manner, manner, each of them working in a state average manner, so that each of them is able to respect this fundamental principle we have here. The first uh, approach is actually a state average VQE, mainly inspired by the work of Nakanishi with the subspace search expansion paper. So the idea is that uh, if, I for, for example, I want to focus on the formaldehyde, I will initially use two initial states, orthogonal states. We start with this and the Hamilton of the system. First step will be the frozen core approximation Hamiltonia, which is encoding uh, in an effective way what is occurring inside the active space of the molecule. So this is the reference operator we're going to use there. Then we build up a quantum circuit implementing a unique unitary operator. This is very interesting for us because for NISC devices, if you use a unique unitary to transform the initial, co the initial state into two correlated states like this, it allows to save some, some quantum resources. You only use one quantum device to build both states simultaneously. And beyond that, using a unitary is also something that preserves the original orthogonality property of the initial state. This is a property that transfers to the output state. So this is pretty cool, actually. And based on this, what we do is that we uh, update the theta parameter of this uh, quantum device by actually focusing on the minimization of the state average energy of uh, the state here, the two correlated states, with respect to uh, the frozen core Hamiltonian. Here, W and WB are, uh, in our approach, uh, defined as equal, so that the, we respect the balance. Each state will contribute in the same way inside this uh, state average cost function. At this point, 
um, if you have read the, the paper of Nakanishi, you will see that this actually represents the very first step of this subspace uh, search expansion. And we found actually that if we use this in order to describe the property of formal domain, it's already sufficient. We do not need any additional, any additional um, diagonalization or optimization. This is already doing a very good job. So interesting feature here. In case of a more complex system, indeed, we could follow more rigorously what is what is done in this paper, but we could also extend this state average cost function by, for example, including um, the um, a measure on the variance of the, uh, the states, which ensure that in the end we end up with uh, the eigenstates of the system. But for formal deeming, it works perfectly. So let's suppose that this converges. We end up with optimal correlated state like this. And what we do is that we give this information to a state average orbital optimizer. And the role of this state average orbital optimizer is to minimize even more the state average energy of the system by playing now with the orbital basis. To do so, what we do is first we implement an orbital rotation operator like this. This operator is going to encode, thanks to single excitation operator like this, a rotation of the whole Hamiltonian of the system, not the frozen core one, here the whole one. This uh, MO basis dependent Hamiltonian still shares the same spectrum as the original Hamiltonian. So nothing new. However, if we apply then the frozen core approximation, so I mean here, if we then define the active space, we define the active space, we end up with a Hamiltonian that will have a different spectrum compared to the original active the space Hamiltonian, the frozen core one here. And this is a new degree of freedom for us because if we play with the shape of the orbitals, we can actually minimize the state average energy of this uh, of, uh, of the system with respect to this Hamiltonian. And this is exactly what we do here. And uh, we use exactly the same weight as before. And we end up with, um, with an, an optimized uh, frozen core Hamiltonian. Once this reaches convergence, we end up with an energy that is lower, that, lower than what we obtain at, as the output of the state average VQ. And as a marker of this, we have this new orbital optimized uh, transform Hamiltonian that we give back to the state average VQ. And this algorithm takes over and the ladder does exactly the same job as before. It, it, it looks for the um, subspace of, uh, of the lowest low-lying ion state of the system and so on. It produces optimal correlated states and so on. You give it back to the state average orbital optimization until we, re we reach here a global convergence of the state average orbital optimized VQE approach. So let me now, after this uh, maybe pretty long discussion of the, the steps of the system, give an application of this on the formal dimming molecule. I want to show here that this approach is able to provide pretty nice results. So I consider the formal dimming molecule and the two initial orthogonal states are here, the artifact states and a singlet excited version of the artifact state like this. This is what I obtain when uh, after only using the state average VQE. So without any state average orbital optimization. What I observe here is that uh, in black, the result with our approach. In red, the CASI approach. We have a very good correspondence here. But however, because we do not use any state average uh, orbital optimization, we only stick to CASI. This is the, our lower bound here, and we reach it pretty well. But no conical intersection. Ah, poor of us. But if we include now the state average orbital optimization and we use the SAOO VQE approach until its convergence, we end up with a very nice uh, conical intersection in the spectrum like this. And uh, now the red curves are actually the state average KSSF reference. Okay. I compute here the uh, energy error. We are always be below conical accuracy and we retrieve we describe the conical intersection exactly at the same point. So it's very, very interesting thing for us. 
it seems that we are actually mimicking the um, state average uh, KCCF classical method, known to be a good one for describing conical intersection. Something that is very interesting here is to take a look at the convergence of um, of the system of the sorry of the method because here with the crosses i represent what i obtain if i start with uh, this uh, initial state that is the excited artifact uh, determinant and with the triangle i represent what i obtain the correlated states obtained with the artifact what is strange here but funny is that artifact is better for the excited state on the left of the conical intersection, and then artifact is the best for describing the ground state on the right, which is strange for for I mean regular user. But there it demonstrates that the artifact determinants has a more important uh, decomposition on the excited states here. In the first excited um, version of the artifact determinant. Uh, has described with these crosses, so this state, uh, when you transform it with the with the uh, SAVQE approach and so on, is more suitable for describing the ground state. So here, this demonstrates that if you choose wisely the the initial uh, uh, the initial state, you can end up with very interesting thing that is called the di diabetic states. You you end up with with states. Uh, converge correlated states that cross together. That's a very interesting feature. And we discussed with quantum chemists in France and they say that that's the kind of thing that some people are looking for in quantum chemistry to have very smooth description of, uh, of some uh, interesting properties. So this is a very nice feature that emerges uh, from the uh, SAOOVQE approach. So now let's take at what is happening, for example, concerning the convergence. How do we start from the energy of this and we end up with this energy? So in blue here, I represent the energy Ea, so the energy I obtain when I transform this initial state. In red, what I obtain when I transform this state, and in black, this state average. All the dashed lines here, they are actually the reference, state average reference, ground state, first excited state, and average. We see that uh, with a white stripe, white, a white stripe here, I always represent uh, one iteration of the SAVQE approach, and then a gray stripe, the associated uh, and complementary iteration of the SAOO approach. So this is a unique SAOVQE approach uh, iteration. Sorry, cycle. What we see is that we only need like two or three uh, SAOVQE cycle to reach comical accuracy uh, with respect to this uh, state average CASA-CF references energies. So it's very, very encouraging. And in this case, the artery fog determinant is used to obtain a ground state, and the first excited version of the artery fog determinant is used to obtain the excited state. However, if you switch to this, you have here a crossing, which means that in this very first application of the orbital optimization, the algorithm underst understands that at this point it will be more interesting to use uh, r 3 fog has uh, a good uh, starting point to describe the excited states and the first excited version of r 3 fog has a good representation for the excited states so this is a very interesting property and even if we have this crossing we end up with a good description of the energies so that's something that that is very, very, very interesting, but also that, I mean, can be at the source of some uh, convergence complexity if we, for example, want to use the subspace expansion here, which are always um, try to impose an order with respect to the, to, uh, to the energy we obtain with the initial states we use. But yeah, in this case, as we use an equi ensemble, this is not a problem. So, we also focused on uh, an important quantity for quantum chemistry, that is the energy difference. And I represent here in red, the energy difference for state average CASA-CF, and in black, the energy difference 
obtained with our method. We have a very good agreement, as we can see, always uh, below chemical accuracy. And just for fun, I represent what we obtain with the almost exact calculation of the KCI 1616. We have almost the same kind of trends. However, we have also this uh, little shift. But this means essentially that, I mean, for representing this uh, almost full CI calculation, we should simply increase the, the size of the active space and maybe also include more electronic correlation by augmenting the approach with uh, like uh, perturbative uh, corrections. Um, last but not least, what we also calculated is the fidelity of the states we obtain with our method compared to state average cast state. I will not enter too much into details, but simply focus on the amplitudes. What we see here, if we compare the two methods, is that uh, we always end up with a fidelity that is higher than 99.75%, which means that we end up with states that are almost similar to, almost exactly similar to um, state average cast SF states. So this is, this is a very encouraging thing in, in our method. And this uh, leads us to the conclusion. So during my talk, I have discussed about the effect of the active space approximation also known as a frozen core approximation. And I demonstrated that it can strongly affect the presentation of conical intersection. Only very large active spaces lead to good results in practice. And this is a method that is then totally unsuitable for uh, NISC devices. We cannot afford using very large active spaces. However, for small active spaces, we, we've seen that uh, some classical methods show that only a democratic treatment of the state can help us. And the key here is the use of the state average orbital optimization. Based on this, we've developed in the state average orbital optimized v theory approach, and we applied it on the formal limit molecule. So, sorry, first we demonstrated that the good shape will be to use a state average v theory and then the state average orbital optimization so that we always respect or always respect the um, the um, equal footing treatment of all the states possibly degenerate we applied it on um, the formal limit and we we've seen that sao vqe act as a, a genuine quantum analog of state average cast CF. we obtain the same energies in equivalent state and also we discussed a little bit about the interesting state convergence feature we observe as I said, the diabetic states and the, um, the dependence on the initial states to converge either to the ground or the excited state, which is really, really interesting here. So as an opening, I think that using state average, um, state average orbital optimized VQE states could be a very good starting point if, for example, we would like to, to investigate excited state dyna dynamics. But that will be really something we should do in a near term. So this is the, the end of my talk. I would like to thank you, all of you, for your attention. If you're interested in the paper, uh, you, have, you have to be aware that this has been actually uh, put on archive under the name State Average Orbital Optimized Hybrid Quantum Classical Algorithm. So if you want to check more details, uh, go and find this paper. Thanks again for your attention.